Sarah, the Tudor Travel Guide here, and today we're in the magnificent Hever Castle in Kent. And I'm here to meet Owen Emerson of Hever Castle, who's going to take us on a very special guided tour. So why don't we go straight on over and meet with Owen right now, and let's just dive in. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting us here to see Heva Castle on such a glorious day. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's so lovely to welcome you. Oh, that's wonderful. And of course, this place is such a mecca for so many Amberlynn fans. Oh, yes. And um, I've visited just once or twice <laughs> uh, in my time as well. But you're here to kind of take us into all the nooks and crannies and tell us some of the stories and hopefully bring this place to life. So before we, we're going to go on a tour of the castle, but before we do that, maybe you could just give us a little potted history sure. of, you know, when was the first castle here? What do we know about that? And, and take us through the timeline towards the end of the Tudors. Absolutely right. So um, we believe that Hever is built around 1271. That's when it's believed to have been built. There is a license to crenellate, that is to embattle the manor here at Hever in 1271. And we believe that was granted to a man called Stephen de Penchester, right. uh, who was heavily involved in nearby Penshurst Place, okay. and um, uh, was granted to a a man called William de Hever, who is believed to have been the, the builder. Uh, there is some um, sort of mystery about the origins of Hever. We're hoping to uh, sort of clear that out in the, in the near future. Um, and then the castle goes to a, a family, a, a Kentish family called the Cobham family, um, who are very influential goes through multiple owners um, for very short periods of time really until um, of course Geoffrey Boleyn uh, who's Anne's grandfather um, great-grandfather, my apologies, um, uh, purchases Heaver. And he was the Lord Mayor of London? He certainly was. And right. he's, he's very similar to uh, another family, the Astor family, uh, who built, uh, uh, purchased Heaver um, sort of uh, much later much on. Later. And, and who restored the castle. Saved it. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, in the, the fact that he um, is, is a, a man of means, and he's done so by work. Yeah. I mean, he uh, starts uh, as an apprentice uh, uh, making shoes, so um, he's very much a, a man that has worked his way up and has uh, built a family fortune. And what a fortune it was to have built, uh, you know, to have purchased Heaver Castle. Mm. Um, and uh, it then gets passed to William, Anne's grandfather, and then to Thomas Boleyn, uh, her father. And, and Anne, we believe, uh, would have arrived here at Heaver in about 1505, uh, probably at around the age of five. And this is her, her childhood home. Um, this is her sort of safe haven. So we then move into the Tudor period, and, and who owned the house then? So Hever was purchased by Geoffrey Boleyn, who is Anne Boleyn's great-grandfather. He was a man of uh, relatively low means at the beginning of his life and managed to work his way up through guilds um, to uh, the position of Lord Mayor of London and is able to buy this fabulous property uh, for his family seat. And uh, his son William then inherits and thereafter Thomas Boleyn, who is of course Anne Boleyn's father. Mm. And Anne Boleyn, we believed, would have arrived here in around 1505, and this is where she spent her childhood. This is where she spent her formative years. Um, and uh, we'll talk a bit more about yeah. where she would have inhabited And so maybe some spaces. of the events that occurred when we get inside. Absolutely, yes. That's wonderful, okay. the Berlins, I know that Anne of Cleves of course came to live here. How did that happen? 
So after the fall of the Boleyns and the death of uh, Sir Thomas Boleyn, uh, the property then passes very briefly to James Boleyn. Um, he um, then sells it, really swaps it with some properties in Norfolk, the family uh, home really, uh, with the Crown Estate. Uh, so it becomes part of Henry's Crown Estate. Um, and then after his annulment, uh, uh, of the marriage with yes. uh, Anne of Cleves. The property is then passed um, to her. She's really allowed to sort of rent it and Henry pays right. her rent and he's, that, that agreement is put in place for her lifetime. I see. Um, uh, and we know that Anne spends a lot of her time here at Heaver. Does she indeed? She does indeed. Because that's something I haven't really researched a lot of and it was one of my burning questions yeah. for, for you today. So how much time did Anne spend here? Uh, it's really her country seat. Um, so uh, we know that that perhaps just after the annulment she doesn't spend a huge amount of time here but increasingly as her um, fortunes deteriorate uh, certainly when she transfers from being uh, the Queen's sister the King's sister uh, to being the King's aunt uh, with Edward uh, he strips away a couple of palaces from her Bletchingley and Richmond and we know that Anne increasingly spends her time here at Heaver. Oh, that's really um, interesting. Yeah, so is, I know there's I've seen at least one letter from her here. Are, yeah. there, are there more? There certainly are and a lot of them um, are to uh, to Cleves. They're actually located oh. in the Cleves ar uh, archive. Oh there. so she's writing home to her that's family right, yeah, at absolutely, home. Absolutely yeah. House, isn't it? Which is, is this the oldest part of the oldest part of the castle? Yeah, it certainly is. We're just walking from the medieval part of the castle uh, into Geoffrey Boleyn's house that he sort of slotted in between the curtain walls. Um, it has been renovated by the Astors, but this is uh, the, the Boleyn's family home that he uh, inserted into the castle. And is this how it would have looked in Anne's time? Are there any features that are different to how she would have known it? Yeah, so the Astors restored a lot of the wood. Um, um, and the patterning we know would have been different and also uh, the levels are, are slightly different uh, for example there are three levels over here when the, originally there would have only been two um, with the third level at the back uh, the long gallery which we'll see later I see so so really it was a little bit more squat maybe That's right. yeah, uh, absolutely. In, in the 16th century yes. um, so and Am I right in thinking that in the medieval period there would be just maybe a simple hall beyond there? That Absolutely. We even think there could have been what is called a loggia, an open uh, space uh, with a gallery above it. Um, so early long galleries uh, had an open space below them and then a, a simple gallery above, which is what we have with the staircase gallery. Uh, so there's every possibility this was an open space that we're going into now and, uh, and then we'll go... What, what into what was the Tudor kitchen? Okay, well, maybe we should go and do that right now. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, Owen, this is such a beautiful room now. It's all beautifully panelled and there's all this glorious wooden carving, fabulous paintings. But in the 16th century, this is not how this room would have been at all, is it? Not at all. We're actually um, uh, in this rather deceptive space at the moment uh, because this was uh, actually the Tudor kitchens. Uh, this is a very much a domestic part of the castle and uh, it certainly wouldn't have been uh, inhabited uh, by the Boleyns themselves, no. although I'm sure children used to sneak in. Sneak in, in <laughs> as children do. Dart around, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, in, in, in essence, really, um, my understanding is the Great Hall is beyond us in that direction. And there would have That's been a right. passage through here into the kitchens. And then the yeah, kitchens you can actually see here. the passageway still here. Oh, that is the uh, passageway yeah, yeah, behind we've, that uh, door. We've got uh, some hidden doors here. Ah. And, uh, yeah, so that would have been the passage through into the Great Hall. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we would have had huge, great big fireplaces over here. And um, yeah, this would have been a very, very different space indeed. So would this have been the size of the kitchen or has it been, um, it must be because of those thick walls. I can't imagine they... <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is a small family home. So yeah, um, uh, yeah this is precisely the, the size of the kitchen. It's actually slightly uh, larger than it would have been. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's... Um, uh, 
perhaps a shame that we don't have the original kitchen still, but we do have this fantastic reception room. I must admit the Astors did do a good job, even, really even though the interiors you know, aren't authentic. They Absolutely. did a wonderful, wonderful job. They so. really did. We've come into this beautiful room and whenever I walk into this room I kind of just takes my breath away because it's so beautiful, it's very feminine. They've got this gorgeous inlaid panelling, this amazing moulded ceiling. But when I was doing my research for Le Ton Viandre and also for uh, In the Footsteps of Anne Boleyn, uh, I, my understanding was that the family didn't really use this side of the castle. So, so what do we know about what was here? Sure, well, um, you're completely right. We're actually start, uh, standing in what was the larder uh, for the Boleyns. Uh, behind us again would have been another larder and beyond that the dairy. This is the um, we're in the walls of the castle, it's a very cool place. Um, so we do have a very crude um, drawing of, of what was here. And um, yeah, so this is again is a very uh, domestic space. It's just off of the kitchen and it's a, a place that the Boleyns wouldn't really have inhabited. Yeah, kind of what an uh, amazing transformation Astor has affected in here. Yeah, he's just transformed this from a, a place of labour into a place of leisure because he has no need uh, for that early space. Yeah, very well said. Um, so you're, we're moving into a very privileged part of the castle. Uh, we're now very valued guests because we are entering the private sanctum of the Boleyns. And that was the Chatelaine's office in that direction. So that was really the territory of Elizabeth Boleyn. So if her husband Absolutely. was away at court or on diplomatic mission, that's where she would run the castle from. Absolutely, that's where the finance of the castle, the estate was run from. And um, we've now moved into a private space. Hmm. Uh, we talked about the creation of a private space, and this is uh, the Boleyn's parlour. You're right. And so just to orientate everyone, if Indeed. I put my hand on this wall here, That's right. on the far side is the Great Hall, where we just come from. And we're supposing that there would have been a doorway that led Indeed. through from the Great Hall into this private space. So this is a place people would come to to retire, wouldn't it, and have some privacy. Absolutely. This is a, a, a real definition of the Tudor period um, th and also the status of the Boleyn family. This is Thomas saying that I can afford private space, something that wasn't uh, expected in the medieval period of a man of his status. This is really saying he's mm. risen up in the world and it's also telling uh, his visitors that he can afford for his women not to work. This is where they would have done clean work, uh, such as black work. Um, so he's, he's really letting people know that he's... he's and the black work being the embroidery, that beautiful beautiful That's embroidery right. on cuffs and, and, and sleeves that we would have seen. That's right, it's considered a, a, a leisure pursuit, it's not a, a, a pursuit of labour for a woman uh, of, of Elizabeth's status. And I love coming in here and thinking of the, you know, the crackling fire in yes. winter and they've been out riding in the park and they come in here and they're pulling off their gloves and they're talking and again, goodness knows what only conversations happened in this room. Oh, many, many, <laughs> many, 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 many. So with that, we're actually we're ready to go upstairs, aren't we, and see yeah, some indeed. of the upper apartments. So we'll go up that fabulous little spiral staircase and uh, carry on our journey up there. Let's go upstairs. Mm. 
now and we've come up those lovely spiral staircase into this tiny little room but it's one of my favorite rooms because it's Amberlynn's bedroom and the most obvious question is is it was it well what I can say is it's got a very long tradition of being called Amberlynn's bedroom um, and it certainly would have been a space intimately known to Anne uh, because we are now above the parlor uh, and therefore we are in the great chamber this is the solar uh, the sunroom uh, mm. or the private room. Mm. Uh, so this, that stretched right across this wing, didn't it? Right across the west wing, mm. and this is the inner, most private sanctum of the Berlins. Mm. You were very privileged people indeed if you were allowed into this space. Mm. You're very close to the family, and uh, this is really where they spend all their time at Heaver. If they're not outside hunting and hawking, they're essentially in here, living Absolutely. and sleeping. Is that right? Absolutely. So we can definitely say this is an anteroom to that great chamber. Uh, but in the great chamber, which we'll go into shortly, uh, that is where they did everything basically this is their their private space now there's a lot of sort of I often get asked questions about where did people sleep where did Am sleep where did yeah. George sleep where did the you know the uh, Thomas and Elizabeth sleep now my understanding is generally in these large open rooms they were they were they didn't have separate bedrooms you had to be right at the top of the aristocrat aristocratic heap if you like to have separate bedrooms it would more be like partitioned and everybody um, slept in, in the family slept in one, basically, in one space. Is yeah, that right? Is that very your much so. Family? Absolutely. So um, we talked in the Great Hall about um, servants bedding down. Very much the same concept is uh, applied to the Great Chamber. Um, almost certainly the Lord and Lady of the house may have had a separate uh, mm. bedding down space. Uh, but certainly the children would have all had... Um, sort of semi-permanent beds in that area, often partitioned off with tapestry. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a, a multifunctional space um, that is repurposed throughout the throughout day. Throughout the day. Exactly. It's also their private dining room. That's where they dine on family. Yeah. Um, so it's... So yeah. it's, it's shifting all the time and the servants would have come up and maybe put the hanging spaces up and then, then move them away during the day. Absolutely. It's yeah. a, a multifunctional space. It's very economical. You only have to warm uh, this one area for the family. Yes. Um, so, uh, but yes, if... If you want to walk in Amberlynn's footsteps, you're in the right place. So this the whole castle. wing is part of that. Absolutely. Having left Amberlynn's bedchamber, we walk through into this much larger chamber. So as you were saying, this was once the great chamber, part of the solar that extended across this entire wing. It's been divvied up now, hasn't it, yes. into a smaller chamber. But so, you know, what else can you tell us about, about this room? So I told you originally that there are only two floors um, to this uh, castle. Uh, so originally it would have been a much larger vaulted ceiling to the great chamber. Oh, I see. Um, and we know um, that also, we mentioned earlier Anne of Cleves, this is also her great chamber. This is where she spent most of her time. Yes, because I've seen online there's an old photo, Anne of Cleves' chamber, and it's done as a, literally as a bedroom, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and it was a, a bedroom during the Astor's time, so uh, we know that when she's writing those letters from Heva, it would have been in this, this space. This, this, this is, is where she did here. it. Yeah, so absolutely. It's a really intimate space, and you've got a couple of fantastic artefacts in here, haven't you? Really you really do, yeah. I really love is this incredible tapestry because it is it date from 1520 1520s that's up to 1520s correct, yeah. and do you want to tell us a bit about it and, and any kind of juicy tidbits that sure. you can you know <laughs> enlighten us with so this is very much a working theory and something that um, Alison uh, our curator and I are sort of speculating about at the moment but traditionally this was bought as the wedding tapestry of Mary Rose um, Henry VIII's younger sister yes uh, to Louis XII um, and there's always been a question mark over that because it's a, a fruitless marriage only lasts a very short period of time uh, and as we know tapestries take a long time to create 
Um, so Good we've point, always, Owen. We've Good always point. wondered why uh, a tapestry that might have even taken six years to create uh, would have been uh, continued uh, after a less than six month marriage. There is a clue, however, and it's uh, just here. Um, ah. This actually says Esther. Uh, you, and, gosh, I've never noticed that. And the crown of Esther, if mm. this is her, is very similar to the crown worn by Esther in Henry VIII's own tapestries of Esther. And Esther is actually quite pertinent to Anne Boleyn's story because, of course, we know uh, that John Skip, her, uh, her almoner, evokes uh, the tension between Esther, the Jewish queen, and Haman, uh, who tries to bring down uh, the Jewish queen. Uh, and, of course, Haman is hanged. And this was largely seen as a, a threat, uh, a warning shot from Anne to Cromwell um, uh, regarding uh, the dispute that they're having at the time. So we well, might that have sheds a whole yeah. different light on this tapestry, doesn't it? It's a work in progress, but yeah, these things are slightly uh, starting to unravel. So do we think, even if it's got a different story behind it, that any of the Boleyns are actually portrayed in this picture? Well, tradition is that um, if this is the wedding tapestry, that Anne is somewhere depicted in the tapestry. Yes. Some people say it's this young lady over here, yes. uh, because we know that she's in attendance uh, at that marriage. Um, but who knows? Who knows? I mean, everyone has their own... They do, and I have, I have mine, which is that lady in the blue. Ah. She looks exactly to me like the portrait, but there you go. Yeah, she's got her nose, I'll give you she's that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, well, maybe we will know. We're always saying, aren't we, that we'll never know, but things are coming up all the time. Wait so and see. Yeah. Wait and see. <laughs> And this is this beautiful staircase gallery. It's just filled with light. And it was such um, a trendy, wasn't it, feature in its day. And I, and I guess quite expensive to build. What more can you so. tell us about it? Well, we know that galleries are really a status symbol, uh, as well as being a practical way of linking two wings of uh, a medieval uh, property together. Um, if this was built by Thomas Boleyn, as it is believed to have been, it's one of the earlier galleries in England right. uh, to have been built and of course there's another one upstairs uh, which again has a question mark over it as to when it was actually built uh, but originally this is where the Berlin staircase would have opened out into hence the name the staircase gallery yes because it, the yast has changed everything around so did, originally yeah. the staircase was really right next to the the, the door and would That's come right. up in, in like a not in a spiral, but in a... Yeah, in a sort of U-shape up into the Up, up into, into the, the gallery. staircase gallery. So That's there would right. have been an opening somewhere here in this gallery. That That's it, yeah. You would arrive yeah. into this beautiful space. And my understanding is, of course, uh, as far as we know, Thomas Boleyn put in all the glass here, and that was, of course, a very expensive undertaking in Hugely the time, wasn't so. it? Hugely so. And, of course, um, glass was a rather transient thing at that time as well. If you weren't particularly wealthy, you might even travel with your glass oh, yeah. to different properties and it would just be crudely shuttered up for the poor servants that yeah. had to retain the property. Um, but yeah, this is um, a, a stunning status symbol. It's a way of progressing with your visitors uh, uh, to your most important room, uh, yeah. which of course is the long gallery upstairs. Yeah, and we're going to go there in a minute, but just to highlight that, you know, with the change from the medieval house to the Tudor house, that they had to have a way, didn't they, of linking the two sides. Absolutely. So you didn't have to go outside or, yep. you know, you wanted to be able to, as you say, progress in comfort and style with all the paintings of your, um, you know, your most important relatives, family or king or queen on the walls. And this certainly delivers on all, re all regards. It really does.
having walked down the staircase gallery, this brings us back into the east side. We are indeed. The east side. So we've come back across the castle now, and we're in what is called the Henry VIII bedroom, which is a fine-looking bedroom with this really magnificent bed. Absolutely. But... I get so many people say to me, did Henry VIII stay there? Mm, I don't think he did, but you tell us the story. OK, so I'm going to tell it from my perspective as a historian. Um, we know that Henry almost certainly would have visited. Um, for example, we know that he's staying at his property, Penshurst, uh, in uh, 1528, and we know that Anne is here at Hever. Uh, this is when she is deciding to marry him. Uh, so it's almost inconceivable that he wouldn't have used this opportunity and this more private location to come and visit his mm -hmm, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. But would he have ever stayed at Hever? Mm. I'm not so sure. Uh, and the reason I say that is because he owns Penshurst Place. He can take most of his court, all of his uh, retainers, all of his security, essentially. And it's only uh, four miles down the road, isn't it? Ride, nothing, it's nothing, nothing for, exactly. for the Tudor king. So did he stay here? It's possible. Um, we know that Henry does stay at properties of this size, um, but we also know that he would have stayed in the most important rooms at that time, which of course was the Great Chamber. Uh, and we know that the Billings have two properties, uh, so um, uh, they also have a heap of Brockus, so they might have potentially moved out to Brockus and, and Henry uh, would have stayed here. So uh, I'm yeah. open to the idea, uh, we can't prove it either way essentially. Yeah, okay. Right, well, you know, there are lots of myths uh, in Tudor history and sometimes, as much as we'd like to believe something, we might have to uh, accept that maybe it's just not quite right. Indeed, I mean, it, it might smack slightly of the so-called Anne Boleyn Room in the Queen's House at the Tower of London that was created in the Victorian era uh, uh, to a public who just wanted to see the spaces that Anne was in and, and really weren't prepared to accept that yeah. it didn't actually exist anymore. So when we come and enjoy the Henry VIII bedroom, we really just have to uh, just enjoy it for what it is, which is a fine recreation of a, of a Tudor room. In a sense, a Tudor room, but the interiors are probably later. And... Absolutely. But we've, we've got, got this great bed, though, haven't we? And that is genuine bed. Tudor. You were just mentioning that to me. Can you, what can you tell us about the bed? Yeah, so a lot of research is actually being done by a historian at the moment, um, someone very famous uh, for... Uh, <laughs> researching beds, Jonathan Coyle, mm -hmm. um, and he has, uh, you know, demonstrated that there is actually an, an ER on the bed. Uh, so is that Edward Rex uh, or is it little Elizabeth Regina? Um, we don't know yet, but so it's, it's certainly a, a Tudor bed. So it's a... And you can see by the carving, it's just full of, of, of symbolism. And I'm sure Jonathan's going to unpick that and it's got a whole Absolutely. story to tell us. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's all there ready to be unfolded, as it were. Mm. Very good. This has got to be, you know, one of the most beautiful spaces because it's this gorgeous long gallery here. Um, of course, totally de rigueur for any Tudor house. Uh, so what's the history of this gallery? So we believe it's actually a Thomas Boleyn insertion. This is a huge status symbol. It might be one of the earliest long galleries in the country, actually, in a private house, at least. And uh, this is, you know, the ultimate status symbol. Um, it's uh, also a place of leisure. This is where the Berlins would have done their daily exercise if the weather was slightly unclement, for example. Uh, and it's also a place to hang your most uh, important possessions, your paintings, and display other items of, of value and of interest to your guests. Um, so it's traditionally thought this is where Henry would have held court when he visited. Mm. Uh, there are some lovely sketches of him doing so in this uh, long, uh, long gallery. Um, but yeah, it's a remarkable space. Uh, Astor really elevated it with this fantastic plaster work on the ceiling. It really is very special.
And so to insert the gallery, Thomas Berlin, basically this is when he put the, he, he kind of put a roof, a ceiling in the Great Hall below and exactly. this really sits above the Great Hall. Yeah. So it actually spans the width of the castle, uh, it's above the Great Hall, we're above that now, uh, and also the kitchens, uh, both of which would have had vaulted ceilings beforehand. Um, so although we're in the long gallery, I think this actually uh, serves to demonstrate how small Heaver Castle actually yeah. is, this is the width of the castle. Uh, yeah. So although it's a very uh, large and airy space, it really demonstrates how, how dinky we are as well. I think. And you're always changing what's what's in this space, aren't you? And, and quite recently, you opened a new exhibition of, of paintings. I think that was David Starkey who put that together. And there are some beautiful paintings in here, so maybe we should just wander over and just have a look at a couple of them. I think we should. And no visit to Hever Castle, of course, would be complete without us coming to look at a portrait of Anne Boleyn. So here is the lady herself. What can you tell us about this particular portrait? Sure, well, it's the iconic uh, so-called Hever Rose uh, portrait of Anne. Uh, it's described by numerous historians as the uh, portrait of her, the most uh, reasonable one that mm. fits the descriptions that we have of her. Um, it's something of a mysterious portrait. It wasn't purchased by the Astors, or indeed our present owners, the Guthrie family. And we know that a portrait of Anne uh, was here um, for most of its history, uh, since she was here. Um, we actually have very little provenance for this painting. And uh, Alison, the curator of Hever, is hopefully going to be able to test uh, the wood uh, that it's painted um. on the panelling, some dendro. Uh, chronology on it and um, we're hoping to put it in uh, the timeline of the portraits of Anne. Of course the National Portrait Gallery um, portrait was tested it was. Uh, and found to be Elizabethan uh, so we're hopeful that ours might be a bit earlier. Well, yeah, well there you go, we're going to have to watch this space Absolutely. aren't we? Yeah. So yet more really interesting things coming our way. It's all happening it's here. It's all happening here <laughs> at Hever. Well, thank you so much, Owen, for showing us around. This has been amazing. And, and it's so wonderful to finish our little tour here. And this is part of the end of the Long Gallery, isn't it? It's, a, it's supposed to be very historic. Absolutely. I mean, this is traditionally where Henry was um, supposed to have held court. It's at the very end of the Long Gallery, and therefore any visitors to him would have had to process right down uh, to see the, the man himself. And you can imagine him, can't you, in oh. all his splendour with his <laughs> jewels, and oh, it must have been amazing. But really, this concludes our tour of the the, you know, the Tudor, particularly the Tudor part, um, there, is, there are other rooms more related to the Edwardian period when the Astors um, took over and looked after Hever Castle. But, so, so just enormous thank you from me. And, but looking forward for people who maybe want to plan a visit here, and I know, you know it's at the top of every Tudor <laughs> lover's list. You know, what, what can people look forward to maybe in the year ahead? And yeah, sure. any other? We're just coming towards the end of our jousting season. So anyone that wants to come and see jousting, I'd recommend that next year. I mean, it's uh, a fantastic event mm. uh, to come to. Go to our events page. We have an amazing array of events throughout the season. And uh, it, that concludes with um, a fabulous Christmas um, experience here, uh, which I'd love to invite you uh, to come and see. Oh, wow. Uh, if you'd be interested. <laughs> I would love to. We'll be right back here. I've never been to Hever at Christmas. I've seen the pictures. It looks amazing. And I think our listeners and those people who may be watching this on YouTube would love to see more of Hever dressed for Christmas. Fantastic. I mean, it's a magical experience. And also, um, after September, when we um, are able to uh, announce some of the history, um, the, the new history of Hever uh, that has been conducted 
uh, this year. Yes, because you have been doing some digging, haven't you? And yeah, there are absolutely. some interesting things that might be coming our way that we can all salivate over while we wait. Absolutely. We're going to have uh, actually a huge amount uh, to tell you of, of, of the history of this place that, that has never been heard before. And uh, yeah, I'm very, very much looking forward to inviting you back around that Christmas period to, to hear all about Well, this is going to be the best Christmas ever, so I can't <laughs> wait. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Thank you.